So question one says, explain briefly the reason why cell is considered a functional unit of life. We we'll see that's how we define cell to be the functional unit of life. So why is cell a functional unit of life? In other words, so a cell is considered as a functional unit of life because it performs all essential functions like metabolism, growth, reproduction, response to stimuli, and all the functional units of life. So every living organism is made up of cells and the life processes that take place occur at the cellular level. So growth occurs at the cellular level, excretion, respiration, they all occur at the cellular level. So that is why cell is a basic unit of life. The B says, outline the process of endocytosis in a cell. So endocytosis is basically the process by which cells engulf external substances by folding its plasma membrane inward to form a vesicle. So let's say this is the way the cell is and this is the substance that's about to enter. It forms a vesicle. So there are two main types of endocytosis. We have phagocytosis for engulfing solid substances and then pinocytosis for engulfing liquids. So the vesicle is then transported into the cell for further processing. So basically that is endocytosis. So two functions of endocytosis. The first function is that the cell uses endocytosis to ingest nutrients and other essential molecules. Also endocytosis is used in organisms to remove um, pathogens. For example, um, the macrophage, which is um, part of the immune cells, that's the white blood cells, helps to digest harmful pathogens. So D, it says explain the role of pheromones in insects. Now pheromones are actually chemical signals released to communicate with other members of the same species. So they help in um, attraction of meats, they help in marking territories, and they are also used in coordinating behaviors. Like for example, when you see ants moving in a trail, like in a street line, moving and following the same path, they are actually following the pheromones that have been released in that path. The next one says, state two applications of pheromones in biological pest control. So in biological pest control, what are the two applications of pheromones? Now, note that pheromones are actually chemical signals used by organisms to communicate and offer, they offer unique applications in biological pest control. So the first one is, they are used in disruption of, you know, mating systems. When a particular area is flooded with a specific pheromone, it can confuse the male insects, prevent them from locating the female ones. And it helps to actually reduce the population rate. Pheromones are actually used for monitoring as well. So certain traps are baited with pheromones and they attract specific pests. Now this allows the farmer to monitor the population and then determine the need for an intervention. So the next question says, name two components of the stoma of a plant. So the stoma of a plant contains guard cells. It also has cuticle. Yes. And the next question says, explain briefly the mechanism of opening of the stomata in plants. So um, the stomata opens as a result of um, environmental factors like light and the water. So when light strikes the plant, it triggers a series of chemical reactions that lead to the accumulation of potassium ions in the gas cells. Now the increased concentration of potassium in the gas cells draws water in through osmosis. The total pressure that is built up in the cells, you know, make it swell up and then the stomatal pores open. The next question is explain the term nutrition. Nutrition is the process by which living things take in food and convert it into energy. The nutrients, you know, that are gotten from the food is necessary for growth repair, the maintenance of other life processes. So we ask to name the mode of nutrition for the following organisms. So fen, fen is a plant, so it's autotrophic. Plasmodium, 
Osmodium is parasitic. Tapeworm is parasitic. Food. Food is heterotrophic. It depends on other organisms for food. Rhizopus is saprophytic. It grows on um, matter that is decaying. Plamidominus. Plamidominus is autotrophic like plants, and the hibiscus is also autotrophic like plants. Name the mode of nutrition in the following organisms. So the next question is different from humans. So I believe what it's asking is how is the organisms that we mentioned initially, how are they their mode of nutrition different from that of humans? Now, um, humans actually depend on a variety of plants and animal based foods. Humans feed on variety, but these organisms mostly do not, it has nothing to do with the variety. Once the substrate is there, or once the particular food they want is there, they just go for it. So that's the difference. The C says, explain briefly how food swallowed by a Lyme patient on the hospital reaches the stomach of the patient. So, this is very simple. I just wanted you to explain peristalsis. Peristalsis is a series of wave-like you know, muscle contraction in the esophagus, which pushes the food down the throat to the stomach. Now, this process is actually not affected by the position of the body. The food just moves downward. That's all. So the next question is, what is humidity? Humidity refers to the amount of water we find in the air. Then the next question, let's say biotic factors affected by humidity. Um, the temperature is affected by humidity. Then rate of evaporation. Then air pressure as well. The next question says, state two effects of each of the following factors on spirogyra in its habitat. So how does temperature affect spirogyra? High temperature increases the rate of photosynthesis in spirogyra. Also, extremely high temperature can cause enzyme denaturation, leading to reduced growth of the spirogyra. And when there is increased rainfall, increased rainfall provides more water, which is essential for the survival and growth of the spirogyra. And excess rainfall can cause the habitat to be diluted and then just reduce the concentration. Light intensity. Higher light intensity boosts photosynthesis, and low light intensity reduces energy production, it slows down the growth process. The C says, explain briefly the process of natural selection in a population. So natural selection is a process by which organisms which eat that better enable them to survive and reproduce in a particular environment are more likely to pass on those traits to their offspring. So this leads to a gradual change in the genetic makeup for population over a period of time. Is this name causative organism of the following diseases? Cholera is caused by bacterium, vibrocholery, measles is caused by the measles, virus, and then malaria, plasmodium parasites, which are protozoans. Then the next question is let's two causes of diseases. So there are two causes of disease. One has to do with biological agents like virus, bacteria, fungi, parasites. Then the other one is environmental factors. This include lifestyle, toxins in food you consume, radiation, and so on. So the next question, you are given a table and you are asked to complete the table by naming two blood components that protect the body against diseases and explain the function. The first thing that comes to mind definitely is the white blood cells. White blood cells, what do they do? So WBC, what do they do? They are part of the immune system. They fight against biological agents by engulfing them, sometimes producing antibodies to neutralize them. Then also platelets. The platelets can prevent diseases. How? If you are asking. So when you have a cut and then Let's say a microorganism or a germ wants to enter. You know what the platelet does? It forms a clamp to seal the wound. 
So these microorganisms will not be able to enter. The next question says distinguish between antigens and antibodies. Antibodies are proteins in the immune system. They bind to specific antigens to neutralize them. Antigens are the disease causing agents. So the antigens bind to the antibodies. The antibodies are proteins. That's what it is in the body. I realize that most of the questions we've answered have to do with um, body processes. And if you are going to write elective biology, you should master the body processes very well with your genetic variation, even in um, the greater science. So we are going to reach something practical and then apply our minds to it. Okay. So the question is, a man, homozygous, resource positive, capital R, capital R, is homozygous, is married to a woman who is also homozygous, resource negative, small r, small r, and they had four offspring. With the aid of a genetic diagram, determine the resource factor to the offspring. So capital R. Capital R, capital R, small r, small r. So this goes for that, this goes for that, this goes for this, this also goes for that. Now when you look at them carefully, this and then that. So you are going to have heterozygous for the first, heterozygous for the second as well. Looking through carefully, heterozygous for the third, heterozygous for the fourth. So that's how it goes. So the first question says, what is the phenotype of the offspring? Capital R here is the dominant, is the dominant allele for all of them. The phenotype of the offspring is resource positive blood. The next question says, what is the genotypic ratio of the offspring? The genotypic ratio of the offspring is 100%. Now, this is the genotype. They are all heterozygous. So it's 100%. The next question says, list four process by which substances are transported into the cells of mammals. So simple diffusion, that's one. Then the next one is facilitated diffusion, which requires a protein carrier to move molecules. And then active transport, using energy to transport substances over a concentration gradient. The next one is endocytosis. So the next question says, this for mineral salts that could be found in a soil sample. So mineral salt, not an element, so mineral salt, example of mineral salt that can be found in a um, in the soil is calcium carbonate, CaCO3, and then um, potassium chloride, KCl, and then Magnesium sulfate, Mg, SO4. All of these are salts. And also ion 3 oxide, Fe2O3. All of these are salts. Great. Name three types of muscles found in mammals. So the type of muscles found in mammals we have the skeletal muscle. The cardiac muscle and the smooth muscle. So, question 5D, we ask to name two types of root multiplication. So, we have the pneumatophore and then we also have the adventitious roots. The pneumatophores are actually specialized roots that grow upward from the soil and above the water surface. Then, the adventitious roots, they are roots that develop from unusual areas of the plant, such as the stem or the leaves. So they help to anchor the plant. So let me not even get to the adaptation. So adaptation of the pneumatophores. We have numerous lenticles that allows for exchange of gases between the plant and then the atmosphere, which enables the plant to survive even in oxygen poor areas. And then the adventitious roots. They help to anchor the plant into the soft, into the soft muddy ground in the swampy area, which helps to provide stability. 
So the next question is explain briefly the involvement of the Forestry Commission in integrated water resources management. So they help to protect watersheds. The forest acts as uh, natural sponges, absorbing rainwater and then releasing it slowly, which helps to maintain the flow of rivers and then streams throughout the year. Also, they participate in water resource planning, even at the local and the national level. The next question is, state for ways in which additives are important in food industry. So the additives helps to extend the shelf life and then prevent spoilage. The additives give some form of sensory appeal, enhancing the taste and then the color. Um, the food additives can also add some form of nutritional value like vitamins and then minerals. And then lastly, they improve the processing and then handling. Then the next question is two harmful effects of food additives to humans. So one, it poses health issues because some of the additives can, you know, elicit an allergic reaction and also um, result in digestive problems. Also, they have an impact on the environment where excessive use of these additives can cause or can result in environmental degradation or pollution. The last and final question says outline four steps in the procedure of identifying ion in a soil sample. So first collection of the sample. Then the next one is the chemical extraction by adding a suitable chemical reagent. And the reagent for um, to extract ion could be HCl. Then colorimetric tests. So you react the extracted ion solution with the colorimetric reagent, which is colorimetric reagent, which is potassium ferrocyanide, to produce a colored complex. So the next one is a visual observation where you compare the color intensity of the solution to a known standard to estimate the ion content.